Uh, hi. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, my name is Ian Romanek. I work on the team. I work in the team at, at Intel that does the open source drivers for all of our GPUs. Um, and I've been working on Mesa and other drivers since uh, 2001. And today I'm going to talk about some recent work that we did to reduce uh, peak memory usage in a couple of the, the compiler paths. Um, for the compiler paths for the, the shading language compiler. So this is basically a talk about optimization. So I'll, I'll bring up a couple of the, the rules of optimization. And I think everyone knows the first rule of optimization is don't. <laughs> or, or, or maybe don't unless you, you know, really, really have to. Because at some point, things are going to happen in your project. People are going to start using it in different ways, trying to, to do more things with it. And you'll have to. Um, but any work that you would do on optimization before you reach that point is going to be speculative. And it will probably be wrong. Right? You'll, you'll, do the, you'll do the wrong optimizations. And so in the best case, you'll either you'll waste your time. And in the worst case, you'll be optimizing for things and making the stuff that's actually important worse. So we ran into a case uh, where we, ha we had to do some optimization uh, recently. Uh, some of our new GPUs that are coming out uh, for Gen 11, uh, they have removed on some of the, the lower power parts, they've removed support for uh, double precision math uh, in the execution units. But FP64 is still required for OpenGL 4.0 and all the later versions. So we're not just going to dump from you know, OpenGL 4.6 or 4.5 all the way back to 3.2 because there's no double precision. Um, so we're going to implement it uh, in software, just, just like you used to do in the olden days before CPUs had, uh, had FPUs. Um, and the performance isn't going to be great, but so far we've literally encountered zero applications that use this feature of GLSL. So I mean, kind of see, see first rule of optimization. Like nobody cares about this feature, so it's OK if it's, if it's slow. Um, and that's a big part of the reason why it's not a required feature for Vulkan, because just nobody actually wants it. Um, so late in 2018, work on soft FP64 was getting pretty close to done. Pretty much all the test cases were passing. Uh, but the guy that was working on it noticed, huh, there's a handful of these tests that I'll start them running. They're going to run for a while. And you know, I'll go make a sandwich or something and come back, and Oom Killer has just wrecked my system. Like, what the hell? Um, and we tracked it down to uh, a, a couple of test cases that seemed pretty innocuous. Um, so we mocked those test tests up and ran them. We have this big, like, 80-core server that we have for doing big compiles and, and some shared DB runs and some other things on. Uh, it has 80 cores. and I think it's, uh, I put in the slides 128 gigs of RAM, which I think is right. Uh, we actually got the test case to run to completion on that, and it peaked at 80% memory usage. So, you know, like it was like, I think, 85 gigs of RAM, which seems really bad. Um, so we kind of dug around and tried to figure out what was going on, because we looked at the shader that was in this, in this program. Uh, in this particular t test case, it has a bunch of uniforms of every possible double precision type. So the scalar, all the vector types, and all of the square and rectangular matrix types. Uh, but then it has to actually use all of those, or the compiler is supposed to dead code eliminate anything that isn't used. So there's you know, a bunch of math using these. The shader would fit on a single slide, um, but the compiler right now inlines every single function. So this tiny little shader just explodes into this huge pile of code. Um, the thing that turns out to be the real disaster of it is this tiny shader that starts off with no flow control ends up with a little over 16,000 basic blocks in it. Because each of those 
functions for doing FP64 operations, they all have to check for things like, should it generate NAN? Did, uh, did you end up with a D norm that needs to be flushed? There's all these sort of exceptional cases that it has to check for. So all these functions have hidden flow control in them. So that all just explodes out. Um, so in, you know, most shaders that come from real applications aren't usually that big. And even the ones that are big, people have tried to optimize them to not have flow control because generally lots of flow control performs poorly on GPUs. So we have this extraordinarily huge shader that doesn't look like other huge shaders that applications would normally give us. I, I guess no one should have been surprised that there was going to be some kind of problems with it. So the second rule of optimization is you know, optimize the right thing. Um, and I sort of condensed it down to a little bit simpler test case uh, that I ended up uh, submitting to, to Piglet uh, for, for inclusion in Piglet um, that is able to hit the problematic paths without having to rely on the, FP6, the soft FP64 code because that hadn't landed yet and also that I could run on my laptop without you know, needing 85 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's one thing to have a, a pessimal test case, and it's one thing to just wreck everyone's systems, and also an entirely different thing if I completely wreck our uh, continuous integration system, because the guy who maintains that will come find me. <laughs> you added tests that umkill everything. Why? Um, so for collecting data, uh, I turn to uh, Valgren's massive tool. Um, uh, which is a, like all, uh, I'm going to expect that most people are at least a little bit familiar with Valgrind. Uh, you, you run it to run your app, and it kind of inserts itself uh, in, in paths in, in your application so that it can collect data. And so what Massif does is it collects data through time about every memory allocation so that then at the end it can sort of show you this timeline of uh, here's how much memory you were using and when and I'm actually going to show some of that. Uh, let's see here. All right, so here's the, so you, you run Massif and it collects some data and then you have another tool called uh, MS Print that you use to actually display the, the data in a, in a Human, human readable might be an overstatement, but <laughs> human puzzle outable or, or something. Um, so the important bit here is the first thing that you get is this, this timeline showing how much memory usage uh, you had at, through the lifetime of the program. And you can see right at the beginning, there was this huge spike up to uh, around 5 gigs that then dropped off. And then there was a couple of smaller spikes a little bit later on. But the, uh, the, the big peak is, is the important one. We can go down and we can look at the output where it will sort of show where memory got allocated so you can see who the, who the big consumers are. And so right here, you know, 98% of the memory that's allocated was allocated, I guess, no, 93% uh, was allocated out of this same function, uh, NER fee builder add value. Wow, for some reason that was hard to say. Um, so that seems like a smoking gun of, hmm, may, may, maybe look here. <laughs> Okay, so fee builder is um, NUR is the the um, kind of the mid-level IR used in uh, Mesa's shader compiler. Uh, it's SSA based, 
and f and so fee builder is one of the is the data data flow analysis pass that inserts the the fee nodes in the in the SSA uh, form of the program. So we've got a couple of things that we could spend some time optimizing. Like we know where all the memory is going, but then that doesn't necessarily tell us what to go start, you know, where to go start writing code. And when deciding what to do, it's not as easy as just, you know, apply Amdahl's law and go work on whatever thing that points at. Because in a real project, there's, there's other concerns. Uh, risk, amount of effort involved, schedule issues, all, all those things matter. So we kind of had three places to look. Um, we could optimize the input shader, uh, which in this case is the mangled input shader with all of our F soft FP64 stuff inserted into it. And we looked at that, um, and it was really unclear if adjusting the, FP60, the soft FP64 code would have that much effect on the final memory usage. We could probably adjust a few things and bring it down a bit. Um, but that code's actually fairly complicated, and it has a lot of twitchy edge cases that it has to handle. So it seemed like even if we could get a good amount of benefit from that, that by adjusting that code, because we're not floating point experts, um, that we might subtly break things. Uh, so we didn't want to do that. And strictly speaking, the reason that so much memory is used in the first place is because every single function gets inlined always. Um, so we thought about, well, you know, if we stop punching the fee builder in the face by giving it 16,000 basic blocks because we inlined the whole universe, I mean, maybe that would just make the problem go away. Um, but once we get down to a certain point in the compiler stack, Functions have never existed beyond that point. So there's a whole, the whole, through the whole back end compiler and all the instruction generation, there's no support for functions at all. So there's a huge amount of code that we would have to go write to support that. Um, and, you know, we needed to ship something. <laughs> so we decided, all right, we'll, we'll take, you know, the obvious approach and we'll go work on optimizing the memory usage of the fee builder. So I'm not really going to talk very much about the process of going into uh, putting a, a program into SSA form and adding fee nodes because it's complicated and I don't understand it even that great. Um, but at sort of the high level, what the process of inserting fee nodes involves is you're going to analyze each variable in the program, and you're going to look at every basic block where that variable might get uh, modified. And then at the points where, it, through the flow control graph, where multiple paths of those modifications could come together, you're going to insert a fee node. Because eventually, what's going to happen is those won't be writes to the same variable. They're going to be writes to new variables. And then when you get to that, that join in the control flow, based on which route you actually took, the compiler is going to program where that variable gets modified. Now, you can assign and ordering two basic blocks in a program, and NUR does this, and it sort of assigns an index to each basic block. So the fee builder just says, well, I'll use a simple data structure that I can index with a unique value. So it just has an array of, at, at the bottom, of the basic blocks, essentially of the basic blocks. It's actually the, the writes in the basic blocks, um, and just indexes it by basic block. Holy crap. Um, so this works great when you have normal programs. When you've got programs with 16,000 basic blocks, now you've got an array of 16,000 pointers for each variable in the program. And almost, you know, 15,990 of those pointers are going to be null. <laughs> 
so replaced that simple array with a hash table, and it slashed the memory usage. We went from uh, just a little over, like, like around 5.4 gigabytes to about 1.3. I was going to show the, the massive output after the change, but I'm running a little bit low on time. I might come to that. Um, but the cool thing that uh, shows up in that, in the after massive output is that first peak is basically gone, and that part of the program is no longer the, the, the long pole. So there's a couple other peaks later on, um, but fee builder is, is not the critical memory usage path anymore. So at, at this point, we had cut the memory usage enough that we probably could have stopped. Um, but I continued on to, to look for some more low-hanging fruit and found that, so we have a, a, a fairly complex system in, in Mesa uh, throughout the compiler stack where we have sort of a, a self-implemented mark and sweep garbage collector. It's not that exactly, but it's roughly analogous. So we don't, we won't ever actually leak memory but we can have transient leaks. So along with a program, NUR will track a bunch of metadata that gets used by optimization passes. So one of the things that it tracks is live ranges for a value. During what range of the program does this value need to exist because it might be read. And various passes will change the, pro change the shape of the program and will invalidate that data. So if you have live range data and you delete a read of a variable because you can optimize out an instruction, well, now the live range changes, so the live range data becomes invalid. Um, so there were a bunch of these passes, a bunch of the optimization passes that would mark this piece of metadata is invalid, but then the data would continue to exist. And by looking at by really digging down pretty far into the uh, the massive data, I found I kept noticing that there was some of the metadata that showed up at points in compilation where we were never going to need that metadata again. And it turned out that it still existed there because it got marked as invalid, and then no one released the memory. Um, so changing literally added four lines of code, and that cut another third of a gigabyte out of the, the peak memory usage from uh, the worst case shader. Uh, and then just to continue on looking at uh, low-hanging fruit, I did a couple of micro-optimizations using uh, PA hole or PA hole or however you want to pronounce it. Um, it's, it's kind of a cool program. Uh, you run it on your object files, and it will analyze your structures and tell you exactly how the compiler actually laid that structure out. And so it will tell you where there's holes in your data structure. So for example, here, after the type field of the structure, uh, to get proper alignment of the pointer that follows that, the compiler inserted four, four bytes of padding. So it's just dead space. And if you rearrange the structure a little bit, you, m you won't have any of that, those, those dead holes. Um, and it's definitely a micro-optimization. Um, in this case, it, it ended up being pretty useful. I don't, didn't have any uh, data about it, um, which I should have collected, uh, because the NUR instruction is the base of every single instruction in the IR. So it, if you've got a thousand instructions in your shader, you've got a thousand of, of these. So having that, you know, four bytes just wasted everywhere uh, adds, you know, it's death by a thousand really tiny cuts. Um, so in this case, what I did is I uh, marked the enum for inner instar type as packed so that in ta instead of taking up a full int, it would only be a byte. And I shuffled some things around. I think I moved the block pointer up to right after the exec node, and then ba basically sorted all of the fields by the size of the, the underlying type, and that eliminated all the padding. And I think it cut, 
what did it do? It cut eight bytes off the size of the structure, I want to say. Four or eight, because of, of padding. And it, you know, it adds up. Um, so possible future work, um, there's still a bunch of places where we use way too much memory. Uh, we could implement real functions, and I suspect we're going to have to, uh, but that's going to be a huge bunch of work. There's also another data flow analysis pass way, way down in the, in the back end that operates on at the machine code level that does a very, very textbook implementation of the data flow analysis uh, algorithm. And so it has these, bit, these huge bit vectors uh, with one bit per variable in the program that, and then you have a copy of each bit vector for each basic block in the program. Um, there's other algorithms that you can use for that that don't <coughs> need to have these massive bit vectors. Uh, I had looked a little bit at, b because m most variables won't be live or accessed during mo in most basic blocks, a lot of the bits in the vectors are either all zeros or all ones. Uh, so I tried using a, a sparse data structure uh, to track that more compactly. And it shaved off about 7% of the memory usage. Uh, because, but since it was a more complex data structure instead of just a simple big flat array, uh, the 7% the memory savings came with a 7% runtime cost. So it wasn't, it wasn't the trade-off that I, that I wanted. Um, but if we basically chuck that algorithm and replace it with something that's not just you know from Compilers 101, <laughs> uh, we won't have the, we wouldn't take the the performance penalty and it would uh, use a lot less memory. How many minutes do I have left? Two. Two. Okay. All right. So I'll. Where's my pointer? Okay. So. All right. So then here's the the after graph. So the first spike is completely gone, uh, and there's just a, a couple of spikes later on. Uh, the peak spike um, is actually during register allocation. Uh, there's a shared component in Mesa for uh, a graph coloring register allocator, and it has some big data structures in it too, especially when you've got lots and lots and lots of, of basic blocks. Uh, I haven't analyzed that code to see if, there, if that can be helped very much, but it's it's really complicated code, and I'd, I'd rather not go in there if I don't have to. <laughs> um, but, okay, yeah. So that was what I had for that. Okay, any questions? I'll start here. In retrospect, would you consider it saying to the hardware guys again to re enable FP64? Um, no, no, because I'd rather have that chip space used for stuff to actually make programs that people care about go faster. Um, and, and especially for th those are the really lower power parts. They're mostly targeting OpenGL ES that doesn't have FP64. Um, so, I mean, we. It's frustrating that we had to do all of this work and then had to do a bunch of other stuff to make the work actually work. Um, but I think it was the right choice. And then, do I have time for the one more question? I had the same question. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> then you get the same answer. <laughs> The house table.